Hello again, and welcome to the lecture about texture, which is another one of the elements of art and design. Please make a new section of notes in your sketchbook and call it texture. Please remember, though, that your notes will be turned in with your sketchbook assignments by the last day of class. So I'm probably going to, for online students, I'm probably going to open a submission window during the last week of class, not before then. And that's where all your sketchbook assignments will get turned in. I'll give you more information on this in writing, I promise, later in the semester. So we all know that texture is very easy to define. It's the surface quality or treatment of a shape or a form. So if you're in the field of design already, or if you plan to go into it, let's just focus on the meaning that can be achieved or deduced, I guess, through the different uses of texture. And I just wanna make a quick note um, to address it before you go any further. Some people are made really uncomfortable with certain textures. So some of the images in this presentation might be pretty small, but I'll give you the information on each one so you can go look them up online and zoom in if you really wanna appreciate the skills that it takes to achieve uh, some illusions of these textures. All right, now let's talk about a couple different types. The first one is the most obvious. Number one is physical texture. This is um, just a variation in the surface. It's like the texture of a canvas or wood grain or texture of thick paint, brush strokes, those types of things that can be physically identified, easily identified, they're actual textures. Um, number two though is visual texture, which is an illusion. So this is, number two is the illusion of texture created visually. This is achieved by marks that simulate physical texture. So it's, it's flat, but it has marks that makes you think that the surface has texture. So keep visual texture in mind while you work on your line variation and unity project and also the value scales sketchbook assignment. Remember, the sketchbook assignment is due at the end, not right now. Just a little note. Okay, so the first example that you see on screen is an engraving by the very famous Albrecht Dürer. That's spelled A L B R E. C-H-T, Durer, D-U-R-E-R. -E if you just search Durer, D-U-R-E-R -R in Google, you will find so many wonderful examples to look at. You don't even have to look at this one. So, okay, um, yeah, he's a master at texture. In this engraving, there's really no way to blend, or in, in all engravings, there's really no way to blend stuff like you can with a pencil or with charcoal or pastels or something like that. So what engravers have to do is use lines only that vary in closeness and in thickness to give us the illusion of hair, skin, the horse's hide, metal wood. You can pretty much identify all of these here in this engraving. So remember some of the methods from the line lecture? If you study this engraving, or really anyone, you can find hatching, cross hatching, cross contours, and stippling. I didn't really introduce that to you guys. Stippling is just um, a pattern of dots that creates the illusion of texture. And so in engravings, what, here's how they do it. So an artist will carve lines into sheets of metal. So this one was probably copper, uh, but really thin sheets of metal. And then what they'll do is put ink inside of those little tiny thin grooves. And then they'll put a paper on top of the inked copper and then like run it through a really hard pressing machine and then the ink gets transferred to the paper. And so this is the result. What you see is a, an engraving on paper. And each line is that was carved is copied over, kind of like embossing a little bit. And what's really great about engravings is that if the metal is preserved, really today you can just apply ink to the same super, super old sheet of metal and just keep making prints of this master work of art. That's wonderful. There's very little preservation involved. So anyway. I always, not anyway, I have more to say. <laughs> um, I always love to look at etchings because artists like Albrecht Dürer used so much focus and prowess to make these engravings, all without the power of electricity. I cannot imagine doing this without the power of like a lamp or a magnifying thing with lights on it or something because it does get really intense to work on a small piece of metal like this. But anyway, I digress. I'm done. The third example of texture is called invented texture, which uses marks that don't necessarily relate to the subject itself or to reality. And works like these um, with invented texture are visually striking and they're memorable because they can 
conflict with our subconscious understanding. So um, collage is a form of invented texture. Even if the artist didn't really intend to emphasize the textures and lines created within the collage, our minds can detect that disconnect from reality. We can tell it's a collage, and that's the beauty of, of collaging. You've probably seen um, photos like the, the left example, photos created by photos. You've probably seen that everywhere online. It's a great like wedding gift. Um, but anyway, this, this particular one of Kobe is cheating because the smaller photos don't really make up his form or his coloration, but you get the idea of texture here. An invent texture is created, and of course it highlights or emphasizes the um, texture of the subject. The object on the right, though, <laughs> is by artist Marit Oppenheim. So does your tongue already feel the fur on the cup? Oh, that's so gross, right? Well, this is a perfect example of invented texture. The artist's intention was to transform our understanding of the simple teacup, and they achieved it. So I wonder if you will ever forget this work of art. I sure know. I know that I sure have not forgotten this. It always comes up in all of my texture lectures. Sorry. <laughs> Shield your eyes. I know it's so weird. Blech. So when you're thinking about starting a project or a design or a new painting, you should consider two things. So you got to make some decisions before you start, or I guess you could while you're in the midst of it. But anyhow, um, the first thing that you should consider is the inherent texture of the materials that you're going to use. So for example, fine line markers can create those smooth and crisp lines that can create uh, lots of clarity and high image content. And charcoal and chalk, on the other hand, are softer, more crumbly materials. So they can create softer lines, they can blend easily. So for example, if you're going to start drawing a landscape, and if that landscape might have, mm, I don't know, like some fog in it, then you'll probably go towards something like charcoal because it's easier to capture those traits of fogginess through blending, which you can't really do with a fine line marker because they're so crisp. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. So you always think about the inherent texture of the material that you're going to use to paint or draw. And then secondly, you're also, you should consider the surface texture that you work on. So for example, um, photographs are usually printed on like a smooth surface or smooth glossy photo paper, sometimes matte. And paintings, however, are done on uh, something more rough like a canvas. And all that really does is help the uh, paint because it's a liquid, it helps the paint kind of stay in the fibers, and that's why it's rough. But, it, you know, if you're a painter, you know what I mean. It doesn't always work that way. <laughs> it just helps a little bit. And so next, I want to talk about the illusion of space. And texture can give us a sense of closeness or depth, spatial qualities in paintings, drawings, designs, etc. So um, what artists will do, if you remember from our line lecture, is that they'll vary the size or the thickness or the line weight, the density of marks and the orientation of marks to create texture. But remember this, like I said before, darker marks tend to advance outward, like in example A here. The darker and thicker the line, the closer it appears to the viewer. The, the thinner the line, the farther away it appears from the viewer. But again, um, you can manipulate this rule. So in example B and C, you can see them both. B and C have those like clusters of marks and our eye is drawn inward toward those marks because of their density. So the closer something is, of course, the darker it appears. And if you know anything about contrast, which I hope you do, <laughs> if you know anything about contrast, your eye is going to gravitate toward that special area of the dark, dense marks. Hope, I hope that makes sense. Though These lines in both B and C are all the same weight. Um, but in C, they're in a spiral orientation, so that definitely helps our eye travel toward that dense central area. And then the overall impact is the strongest when the size and the density and the orientation all work together, like in example D. So you have thick lines toward the outer edges of the drawing, or the rectangle, I guess, the bounding box. The thicker lines appear closer to us, and so that's, you can tell that as the spiral gets more compacted in the center, the lines get a little bit thinner, the dots get a little bit denser, and so all of that working together helps us kind of look into this tornado-type spiral. I hope that makes sense. 
the way that you use texture and the way that you build texture in your designs definitely has something to say to the eye. So here is a, a real world example that is similar to that success you saw in example D in the last image. This is a work by Douglas Smith and it's called No Turning. So here the artist combines something called linear perspective and we'll learn more about that later, but basically it's just the illusion of space, space using geometry and mathematics and, and things. But you can tell that, that we're looking down into um, an L-shaped uh, geometrical space, right? That's the power of linear perspective. Okay, so um, as far as orientation is concerned, the lines and the marks in the texture are all oriented along these axes uh, that are built by this linear perspective tool. The line density of the mortar between the bricks, those whitish, grayish lines, and also the line thickness implied by the rows of bricks pull the viewer toward the center of the composition. So notice how, let's, I'm going to try and make it a little bit more simple. I know I'm using a lot of art speak, but notice how the bricks get smaller toward the center of the drawing. You see that? So the, the bricks that are closest to the edges of the drawing are thicker, and of course they get blended together as they go down into that space. And the effect is this kind of stretched and claustrophobic space where our poor little truck is trapped inside and he can't turn, hence the title. But here, the main, uh, I guess, MVP is texture. And it's achieved in many different ways. Um, linear perspective definitely helps orient the texture of the bricks and the mortar, but it helps us to understand the depth and the illusion of space that this artist has created. Okay, I love this one. This, one, this one's so cool to think about. All right, here's a different approach um, to texture, and it has kind of the opposite effect, but it has lots of interpretations, so we'll talk about them. This is a work by an artist named Robert Indiana, and what he did here is first he constructed a 3D model of a coin. So he like blew it up really big, and uh, constructed this little model, sorry, a big model of a coin, and he used cardboard to do so. And then what he did was laid his drawing paper on top of that model that he made and made a rubbing with colored pencils. And I think there are lots of different uh, renditions of this coin, of these rubbings, just like with different colored pencils and different, um, different materials. And so it's a simple project, right? You can probably imagine yourself doing this, but it has so many interpretations. And here's, let's go through a couple. So the first one is that creating a design through rubbing could uh, remind us of the rubbings that we may have made when we were kids. I remember doing a history project where we made rubbings on grave markers in a really old World War I cemetery. So I have a core memory of myself doing that and I can relate to this drawing because of that memory. Secondly, um, maybe some of you know this, Many cultures, rubbing coins uh, evokes wealth and good luck. And so the energy of the act of rubbing a coin, it is literally called a rubbing, but the act of rubbing a coin is really captured on this paper here. So if you are someone who really believes in that and who really takes that to heart, then you can see the pressure and the rubbing of a coin, kind of. But anyway, it, you can connect to it that way. And then finally, this is my favorite interpretation. We've had long conversations about this <laughs> particular drawing in uh, one of my design history classes, but this is the deeper uh, interpretation. Perhaps the artist maybe wanted us to consider the American dream. So maybe if you define it yourself, maybe it's the desire for wealth, the desire for success, etc. The desire for freedom of choice, all these things that might encompass the American dream. Well, the artist here is basically, could be, could be implying that success and the American dream and all these desires are just an illusion that hangs on the delicate threads of the stock market, hence the coin. So it's all this um, foggy mystery created surrounding this image of um, finance, which is a coin. So it's, it's all really deep and you can probably have three hours long conversation. But anyway, the hero again here is texture. And the texture of a model is brought out due to the energetic rubbing with a color pencil and pressure. Okay, I have to include this example. I cannot do this lecture without including this. This is such a powerful work of art. So on the screen, you'll see the full work of art on the left. And then the right image is a 
uh, a detail of the top portion just so you can read the words a little better. So this is another example of visual texture uh, by Glenn Ligon, who's an African-American painter. And this piece is untitled, but the artist here repeatedly wrote this sentence, I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background, just over and over, all the way down. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background over and over. So if you look at the image on the left, the full, the full scale one, notice that the density of words uh, increases toward the bottom. They begin to fuse together, creating this variation of visual texture. And it also, you can't really see it, but you, it reduces the visible clarity. Since they're so dense and so rough down there at the bottom, you can't really read it. It becomes more ab abstract. So this is a great example of clarity and contrast in texture in one single piece. That's, that's really powerful, especially this sentence, since we as American, English speaking and reading Americans, we can read the sentence, so we get how powerful it is. Um, graphic designers often use letter forms like this as subjects in their designs, including, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, oh, those shopping bags that say thank you the red and white ones that say thank you over and over again, one on top of the other, that's an example. Um, the Louis Vuitton symbols that texturize their iconic leather goods is another example of kind of like a graphic design, also fashion a bit. And keep in mind that letter forms can also transform in meaning depending how they're used, especially in a textured context like this. So I know a lot of this is art speak and I'm nerding out over paintings and drawings, but remember that this lecture is about texture. So if you're making any notes in your sketchbook, which I hope you are, then you can make notes uh, of your own observations. There's really no wrong answer here, you guys. You can interpret these works of art the way that you want as long as you here in this context will glorify the texture. So let's also talk about more meaning and the meaning that comes from the marks that we make. So every textural mark that we do make can either add or subtract from the entire composition. When textures are random or if they're inappropriate or if they don't match the subject or something, the composition can become cluttered or confused. But this is something I'm learning myself as an artist right now, Deliberate and calculated use of textures can enhance the illusion of space and increase unity in paintings and drawings. So a masterful use of texture can actually benefit. I know it's not, it's not necessarily something that artists think about all the time, um, especially painters were sometimes more interested in creating uh, emphasis or the illusion of reality rather than texture. The texture, it has has the potential to create real powerful meaning. So here's an example. Um, this is a detail of Benjamin Mara's self-portrait that he painted. And you can tell like by the eyebrows and the eyes and things, each brushstroke describes a different facet of his face. So what happens is this portrait feels pretty sculptural because of these intentional marks. Every brushstroke seems like a decision that the artist has made. So in effect, Ben Mara, the artist, increased the painting's unity and dimensionality through this texture study. So the success of this painting, even though it's a little bit abstract, the colors are a little wonky, um, it's not something we see everyday life, we, we understand it subconsciously because of the artist's masterful use of texture. Okay, so this is our last example. You're almost done, guys. This painting is called Water and Rock Flows by artist Lillian Garcia Roig. That's Garcia dash R-O-I-G, Roig. Here in her painting, you can see the success of both physical texture, which we learned about is literally something that you can feel, and visual texture, which is the illusion of something that you can feel. Well, this painting has both. It has visual illusion of texture and physical, actual, touchable texture, but do not touch the artwork, my friends. You will get in so much trouble. Never, never, never. <laughs> okay, so let me let me show you what I mean. Look at that blue stream on the right side of this screen. That is paint that is directly applied 
by the tube in which it comes packaged in. It's, there's no paintbrush involved. She just literally squeezed it out of the tube like toothpaste onto the canvas. And so overall, you can detect the liveliness of the painting. Um, it's colorful, it's energetic on its own. You can probably see that it's a shallow stream and that the artist is painting during a sunny day. Um, I noticed that because of all the colors. This is a detail of the painting, you guys. So if you wanna see the full effect, it's uh, best if you kind of like step back and take it all in. But yeah, this is a close up of a shallow, rocky stream on a sunny day. But the added dimensionality of that thick paint on the canvas really activates this painting a little bit more. It gives agency to the artist. What does that mean? Gives agency to the artist. So when you see something super textural like this, and when you look at art in person, the artist automatically gets a little bit of agency or it humanizes the artist a little bit more. Um, it gives them uh, a little bit more human quality in your mind instead of like, oh yeah, this is just a printer reprinting the image of life or something. They actually physically made this with their hands. And that's something that texture uh, does uh, successfully is it gives us that idea that this was made by hand. And everybody loves something that's made by hand, right? Oh, and maybe maybe now that you're hearing me nerd out on this, you're like, okay, well, but like, what do we care? Like, why? Like, why does it matter? Yes, it has texture. Great, that's wonderful. Well, it's true. You'd be right. It is a, me a menial thing to sit here and talk about texture all day long. Um, but this is where we get to appreciate the artist, the creator of these masterworks of art, like Van Gogh has has very deep and rich textures in his paintings. And of course, he's definitely celebrated. So what does this do for the viewer? Why do we care? Well, um, whenever you are a viewer of art and you go and you look at paintings in a gallery, you have to get past this question of like, okay, well, what does it mean? You know, everybody asks that. What does it mean? What does this painting mean? What's the story? Some paintings don't really have a story and they just want to, artists maybe just want to introduce you to the process that they use. And so whenever that happens, you often wonder, you get to skip past that question of what does it mean? And then you can start asking things like, well, how did the paint get on the canvas this way? How did they make that? And inherently what that does is puts you, the viewer, in the space of the artist. Because when you imagine this artist squeezing paint out of a tube onto this canvas, maybe you don't imagine her. Maybe you imagine you doing it. And that's the fun part about art because maybe you're inspired to go do it yourself, right? I hope so. I know I'm so nerdy, I'm so sorry. But the more you look at art, the more you will appreciate it and the more you'll be able to talk about it and things. So just, just bear with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in conclusion, to bring it all home, Texture is a very simple and easily identifiable element of art and design, but it can be highlighted in such a way that enhances, it enhances the meaning and engages viewers, just like we talked about. So keep this in mind. Keep texture in mind if you plan on creating physical objects like buildings, fashion, uh, even things with makeup. You can create textures in makeup design, set designs, design goods like something you'd see at Target and so on. There's so much potential with such a simple concept. So um, that is the end, the end. Thanks so much for listening, you guys. I will be posting more videos very soon.